Hello team and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan, MSP. MSPS is Ukraine War News Update for the 3rd of July 2023. It's almost the 4th of July and almost the day that America made that really fateful, terrible decision, isn't it? Oh well, we'll uh, gloss over that. Right, let's go to the... Uh, Ukrainian general staff figures for the Russian losses for the day before. All the usual caveats apply. I find these indicatively useful. They give us a good indication of the sorts of activity that might have taken place on the day before. There is, a, the, I think it's another fairly bad day for Russia, really, uh, looking at the different categories. 600 liquidated personnel, kind of in the middle for stats we've seen over the last uh, month or so. Five tanks, 11 APVs, armored personnel vehicles, those are infantry fighting vehicles, armored personnel carriers, uh, MRAPs, mine-resistant ambush protection vehicles, and so on. Uh, 11, so that's there or thereabouts. Um, I guess still losing 11 a day is, is not great, is it? 32 artillery systems and four multiple launch rocket systems. They seem to be really hammering the Russian artillery at the moment uh, and they have been doing for two months now really uh, for mlrs a reporter from ukraine were talking about how they are almost baiting the russians to use their uh, their artillery and their mlrs then they need to drive off to go and get new supplies so the supplies don't come to the mrs the mlrs have to go to the supplies and uh, that's when, when they've used up the rockets and they they do their salvos and then go and get supplies. That's when the Russians, uh, sorry, the Ukrainians hit with their ground forces. There's a bit of timing going on there. And I, and I presume that's also when they try and take these things out. Uh, it, it does appear, I mean, we've seen some footage that the Ukrainians try and take out entire batteries of artillery at uh, at the same time. There's been a, a couple of batteries we've seen taken out. But uh, yeah, this is just another terrible day for Russian tubed artillery. 32 pieces lost. It's incredible. One anti-aircraft warfare system. Don't know what that is. That, that may be high value, may not. One helicopter taken out. I've not heard about that, but uh, that's another big loss for the Russians if if that has happened. 16 drones, three cruise missiles. It's not from last night. That's from the night before. There were, there were drones sent over last night, 17 drones. Uh, so that was from the night before. 18 vehicles and fuel tanks is high. Seven special pieces of special equipment is very high. So they are hammering these ISI, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, and electronic warfare pieces of kit. Uh, but uh, no great detail on, on exactly what equipment that was. But yeah, another uh, damaging day for, for the Russians and their capability to hit the Ukrainians with their artillery uh, as they are getting consistently degraded. Uh, the exiled mayor from Lysychansk has said that Lysychansk, that's up near uh, Kremina, up in that neck of the woods in southern Luhansk, uh, has said that all medical facilities in the occupied city of Lysychansk have been repurposed as military hospitals for Russian troops. And that is an indication that they are taking heavy casualties in that area, uh, as well as obviously elsewhere. Now, this is doing the rounds at the moment, and this is fascinating. So this is a side of a Patriot, some part, some part of the Patriot air defense system. Uh, this is a shot down list including fighter jets and helicopters. So if we look closely at this, there are three helicopters there. There's a fighter jet there and two different fighter jets over there. Now, what's interesting is when you look at the dates of these. So uh, if we go to the next one, here you see the dates are for those helicopters and a drone next to it is the 13th of May. And as I understand it, that's when... In Bryansk, in Russia, those helicopters were all left, lost on the same day. So at least three of them were taken down by Patriots, and this was a Patriot system that did so. That is really significant because we were wondering then uh, how they all got taken down. Then there were rumors that came out later that they might well have been taken down by Patriots. Um, Thomas Tyner says it's the German Patriot battery that has been roaming around Ukraine's east and south to shoot down Russian fighters, launching glide bombs at Ukrainian border towns. The the one that the Americans gave the Ukrainians is around Kiev, uh, and then there's a German one, and they've got other, I think, launchers from 
uh, the Netherlands possibly, but there, there isn't a whole battery. It's just a few launchers. I don't know where they are being attacked to where they're being attached. But this German system is evidently floating around the country, may maybe down south as well, uh, and is taking out high value uh, aerial targets as well as obviously those uh, cruise missiles and probably Kinjals on the side that that are listed there. So yeah, includes uh, fighter jets and helicopters. Uh, someone else says, um, why aren't more planes on it? Why aren't there more planes on it that, you know, being shot down? Seems like it's been a while since we've heard about such sh shoot downs. And Thomas Tyner replies, uh, Russians have stopped flying within 100 kilometers of the Ukrainian border, except for the south. Now, uh, and then someone else saying, and but some of the glide bombs can have 150 kilometer range. I, I think there has been less report fewer reports of aviation russian aviation being used they've gone back to being cautious other than particularly helicopters in the south uh, their aviation they've been wanting it in the kherson area but i think the we know well the rumors are that the ukrainians have s300s down near kherson so that's keeping the russian aviation at bay down there i think now that the ukrainians have been given a wide variety of air defense systems, ground-based air defense systems, or GBADs, that is pushing the Russian aviation back along uh, quite a lot of the areas of the front line. Uh, and to, yeah, the, the only problem is really low-flying uh, airframes such as helicopters, KF-52 attack helicopters. So jets will need height, especially for glide bombs. They will be much more vulnerable to these air defense systems. If a helicopter can fly just above ground level then radars won't pick them up and that's how they're getting close enough at least they won't pick them up until they're too close so they can get within eight kilometers range of targets and use their anti-tank guided missiles on board to to take out those targets so yeah th that is still the challenge for the ukrainians sabotage on a railway in the moscow region so relay cabinets were relay cabinets were blown up on the nakabino and the kivka stretch i i always wonder how how long these take to replace um, obviously any issues to the railway uh, are really valuable for the ukrainians uh, but the railways can be fixed quite quickly the railway lines uh, they're quite easy to lay uh, so if they get blown up sometimes that's you know within a day they can be fixed i don't know about relay boxes if anyone else knows how damaging that is in in times of tain, in terms of time taken to replace uh, talking about missiles and drone hits air defenders of ukraine shot down 13 drones last night that was out of the 17 that were fired and they do claim that the other four didn't reach their targets either i don't know whether that's as a result of electronic warfare i don't know if these figures they compile these uh, infographics include ones that fall out of the sky from uh, electronic warfare jamming and, uh, and such like but uh, that appears that that all 17 were didn't didn't do what they were intended to do right uh, the shahi drones were launched from primorsko aktarsk which is in the russian krasnodar uh, oblast the other side of the kerch bridge now, what's interesting about that place is that was hit. Although they, they were launched after it was hit, that airbase was hit yesterday. Uh, don't know what by, quite possibly uh, Storm Shadows, but could could be something else. I mean, it, the, these this is a significant crater. Um, the place where they, they launched those drones, this is uh, where it is, military airfield just there. And... Uh, and that is just an absolutely massive crater. Uh, that looks like that's in a field, though. So I don't know that that's actually hit its target, but there's something hit its target because of all that smoke. You won't get smoke like that just hitting a field. So probably a few a few missiles of some variety sent against that target. Right Bank of Kherson was hit again with incendiary ammunition overnight. Uh, that That is something that happens quite commonly. And then the last thing to say about missiles, a Kramatorsk missile that hit the pizza rear killed those 14-year-old twin girls and 17-year-old girl and other civilians. Uh, unfortunately, you know, there was a, quite a, uh, a moving account of how 
someone was sitting having a meal with with this uh with this person who's called uh, Victoria Amelina I think uh, now she has died uh, yeah Victoria Amelina uh, Ukrainian writer and uh, dearest colleague uh, she was uh, yeah she's been in hospital since th uh, the Kranatorsk missile uh, hit and uh, yeah there's a lot of uh, a lot of eulogies going around to her because that was a sad loss for the Ukrainians uh, right now moving on Okay, going on to military aid now, and uh, we'll actually not military aid. We'll yeah, we'll go on to Prigozhin and uh, Wagner. Just do a little bit on him again. Never too far away from the news, even though he's kind of uh, taken himself out of the whole uh, situation. Russian state TV channels report that Wagner received more than ten billion dollars over seven years, on top of, of another ten billion dollars that Prigozhin's company Concord received for food procurement. These are massive amounts. Wagner has always been a state financed elite force, not a private company. So this idea that uh, that Putin and the, that's a different looking Putin there, if you ask me. Putin and the Kremlin have sponsored uh, Wagner, not only in like actual contracts for you know food, uh, well, although that's Concord, but it's all part of the same thing, really. They have paid Wagner directly, and that, since Wagner are a terrorist organization, as denoted by many countries, that makes... Russia a state sponsor of terrorism. Anyway, Wagner has announced on its channels the suspension of recruitment of mercenaries for a month in connection with the temporary non-participation of PMT Wagner in a special military operation and moving to the Republic of Belarus. This uh, I was talking yesterday in my live stream with uh, Professor Gerdes about how BBC, for example, have found that Wagner is still recruiting. You can still go through the recruiting process. Uh, but that may have been stopped subsequently due to them, the Wagner being investigated by the Russian government. Indeed, as Chris O'Wiki says, Yevgeny Prigozhin's business empire is rapidly being dismantled. It's lost its contract to provide uh, rotten, infected, adulterated food. It did have a pretty bad rep for its food uh, to the Russian army, and media empire is shutting down. Thousands of his staff have been made redundant, many with no severance pay. Until Prigozhin's mutiny last month, the Concord Group was the Russian military's biggest food supplier. Russian government paid it 845 billion rubles, or $9.6 billion, under a contract with the Russian Amity's procurement arm, Verntorg. It, that has now been cancelled. Concord also has a dubious title of being the MOD's most sued contractor, with 560 lawsuits being filed in 2022 alone for supplying the Russian army with a food with food contaminated with bacteria, insects and worms, and scams such as substituted ingredients. I indeed gave you um, uh, this thread back in January uh, when Chris O'Wiki did that thread. Uh, Lookout News, ON, reports that Concord's many holding companies have been, quote, working intermittently since the 23rd of June and have been waiting for inspections, destroying documents in the meantime by order of the management. Quote, it was expected that the entire document flow should have been handed over to the new owners by the 15th of July, but yesterday the employees were told that because of the breakdown of the contract between Verntorg and Concord, they would be dismissed. End quote. Concord, several thousand employees who were engaged in feeding the military and supplying food to hospitals and to the occupied areas of Ukraine have been dismissed with resignation letters, which are communicated strictly verbally and no severance pay. It's unclear what impact Concord's demise will have on military food logistics in occupied U Ukraine. This is really important. Not only are all those people suddenly without jobs, now on welfare, and there's no money in the Russian government, as we've been talking about over the last week. You've got that issue uh, and all the supply to to those so the knock on to to the supply chain will be will be will be huge uh, but then who's who's then supplying food now you're going to have to set up uh, an uh, other food production which yeah it might have its own supply and might replace what, what's been what concord have been doing but you can't just do that like you know with a click of the fingers so the russian army could be without significant food for that in intervening period it's just yeah I, I it can only be a, a problem for the for the russians this isn't going to be uh you know making things better so uh, it's unclear what impact it will have the situation 
is already reportedly very bad, with frontline troops complaining they lack food and water. It's unlikely that Concord services can be replaced immediately. Similarly, Prigozhin's Patriot Media Group has shut down virtually overnight. Four sources have told ON that employees of the group's outlets, which included RIA Fan, Nevsky Novosti, uh, Ekonomika Segodnya, and other publications were told to stop working from 3 p.m. on 30th of June. A now former employee of one of the publications says the editor-in-chief announced their dismissal and promised they would get their remaining salaries and severance pay. The employees of this media company, uh, of his media companies, reportedly went out to celebrate a wake afterwards. One employee says, quote, we've been working remotely all week. The website was blocked. A couple of days later, the VK page was blocked. We were left with only the Telegram channel. We've been told since Monday that maybe will be unblocked and will keep working. And today they wrote that we are closing down in the work chat. Wages will be paid. So it's, yeah, not looking great for uh, for those companies under under the ownership of Mr. Pogosian. Right, now on to military aid. Uh, Germany does not want to supply Kyiv with weapons that can be used to attack Russia, says Chancellor Scholz uh, on the question of the long-range Taurus missiles. The Taurus missiles are the storm shadow equivalents that the Germans uh, ha uh, have. This is one of those weird claims, and we've seen this from the Americans and, and from many nations, like we don't want our weapons to be used to attack Russia. We don't want to give you anything that can be used to attack uh, targets in Russia. It's like, yeah, but you've given us... 50 kilometer range howitzers they can attack into russia and they are being used to attack into russia like what this makes no sense a, a rock can be thrown into russia a gun can be shot into russia a howitzer can be shot into russia and a missile can be shot into russia but just goes a little bit further each of those have incremental range you know increased ranges incrementally increased ranges what you're doing is you're special pleading that, that the missile just goes over a particular range. But it, but the idea that, uh, you know, those can be used to attack Russia and other weapons can't is is evidently wrong, demonstrably wrong. So, uh, yeah, I don't go along with that. Now, some people are saying he's saying that, but there is every possibility that actually, you know, under the table they are being given Taurus missiles. I don't know. I can't make comment on that. They, you, they could give them these tourism missiles and, and maybe they could pretend they're storm shadows or whatever. Uh, I, I don't know. But that reasoning is demonstrably, demonstrably wrong. French MX-10 RC light tanks, these wheeled light tanks, uh, are not suitable for offensive operations due to their thin armour, according to AFP, Agence France Press. A military soldier... so. This is obvious, right? Of course they're not. Like These are light tanks. They are not suitable for sending into the vanguard. Um, a military soldier with a call sign Spartanets told the publication that the explosion of an artillery shell near the MX-10 RC could lead to the penetration of fragments through the armour. In one such case, the entire crew died. So, yeah, I don't think these are the sorts of vehicles you are going to be throwing into... Yeah, right into the fray uh, as your heavy armor because they're not heavy armor. These are light tanks, right? Some people don't even call them tanks. So, uh, on the one hand, that's obvious, and on the other hand, maybe they have been used in ways that they shouldn't have been used, and they're now finding that out that actually their armor isn't all that and a bag of chips. Uh, according, and this has been doing a lot of. Um, it's been seen a lot around the internet. There's a lot of consternation over this. According to the information from Der Spiegel, which cites insiders in the arms industry, Germany and Poland have so far made no progress with regard to the maintenance hub for Ukraine in Poland. So there's been talk about this big maintenance hub that they are going to build to repair uh, tanks, different tanks. It's said to be due to astronomical prices demanded by the Polish company PGZ. For example, PGZ wants to charge more than 100,000 euros for the so-called initial diagnosis on the t of the tanks. In Germany, only about 12,000 euros are usual for this diagnosis. In addition, PGZ does not want to assume any warranty for the repairs, which is also completely unusual. I, I didn't even like considered there would be such a thing as like repairing a tank and there being a warranty on it. Yeah, this has got like yeah, it's not a seven year Kia 
warranty. Uh, this is like a seven day warranty because this bad boy is going to get into trouble. I, I just, yeah, it seems really odd, and the amount of money they're charging. This is this is a problem. I mean, you can't do war like this without defense in you know private defense industries being involved, right? Of course, but the the money making that can can be exploited in these areas is is what worries me you know when when you have people who are desperate for stuff to happen then they become desperate to th that desperation leads to being willing to pay much higher prices than than you know i remember changing teaching jobs once and and literally the, <laughs> the establishment i was getting a job what said to me like as i was walking around saying oh like we're desperate at the moment and later they admitted they were in no position to negotiate like it was when they deregulated teachers pay in the uk and i was like well i'll take i'll take what was on before like when you move jobs in teaching in the uk you you drop down scales because they deregulated the the teachers pay scales so the schools could pay whatever they like but as soon as the school says yeah we're desperate you're like well okay i'll i'll have my my wage as it was thank you uh, and that's just an example. Like desperation breeds the willingness to to pay pay over the odds, although it wasn't over the odds for me. But do you know what I mean? So, I the the Ukrainian government is going to be desperate for stuff to happen. The West is going to be de the governments are going to be desperate for stuff to happen. And then the these private defense companies will come in and say, "Well, okay, uh, it's going to cost you this much." Uh, here's a case where actually they're trying to char charge insane amounts of money and that's left you know things not happening because actually they've gone over uh, what people are willing to pay even in desperate situations. Tank Repair Hub, here it is again. The Leopard 2 that was uh, to be set up in Poland between three different uh, companies has made no tangible progress in the last two months. Uh, PGZ is the cause of this for asking unreasonable prices for simple work. Insiders spoke of moon prices. Uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, and F-16, there's delays on F-16 training, it appears. So uh, Smart Ukrainian Cat says there is no schedule of training missions uh, for the F-16 pilots. I believe that some partners delaying it. Uh, I don't know why they do it. That's actually a quote from Zelensky. Uh, there's only one country that can be responsible, the US. Something is wrong, says smart Ukrainian cat with the Biden administration. If I recall correctly, the term says Trent Tilenko and conditions of F-16 simulator sales to foreign nations uh, I was involved with correctly, they included a clause requiring prior US approval for other nationals to use them, which would make this an accurate assessment. So it'll be really interesting to see where the delay is coming from. Is it a governmental delay? Can can you lay this as one of those things where, well, America's responsible, so we're going to blame the guy at the top, and that may be, may be correct. I just don't know whether he, he would have any idea about the schedules for F-16 tra pilot training. I mean, uh, that's going to be out of his wheelhouse, would be my opinion. So therefore, where is the delay coming from? Because surely there's a political will there. It's like, yeah, okay, we're going to do... No, they're not. Biden's not going to be sitting there saying, yeah, we're going to give them uh, F-16s, but I really want you to delay that. And and if someone comes up to me and says, oh, can we can we do, sort out this training schedule for F-16 pilots in, like, Switzerland? No, it's not in Switzerland. In... in Holland or Poland, he's going, yeah, but I want you to delay that for three weeks. I don't want it now. I want it in three weeks. Time. Like, he's not going to be doing that. So where is it? Where is it down that that line uh, where, and in, in the administration or in the military? Why is there a delay? Why is that not happening? Is that a fair representation? Is the delay definitely coming from the US or is it something else? We, we need to know because that needs to stop. They need airframes as soon as damned possible. And whoever is responsible for that, if it is Biden, then that needs sorting out Biden. But I don't think he's going to be walking around saying, I want to delay F-16 training. I just don't think that that's part of what he's thinking about at the moment. Uh, be interested in your ideas on that. Right, let's go to uh, the front line. And uh, it is, again, 
it's, try, it's quite difficult to get really decent details about what is taking place due to operational security, etc. Uh, but over the past week, the area liberated in the east has increased by nine square kilometres, says Hannah Malia. Uh, she's a deputy defence minister, the east being basically Bakhmut. You can include Adivka as well in there. So nine square kilometres in the south liberated area has been increased over the week by 28.4 square kilometres to 158.4 square kilometres. Uh, so there is advancement uh, along the fronts. Heavy battles continue, quote, heavy battles continue on on the northern flank from Bakhmut, there were tactical successes and some progress on the southern flank, said uh, Hannah Malian, which is to say that Bakhivka and north of Bakhmut, uh, really heavy battles, probably not much advancing of the Ukrainian forces there. More success to the south, Kurdi Mifka, Klischivka, around those areas near the canal, if you remember your geography around Bakhmut. She noted that last week, as a result of the improvement of the operational situation in the east, they liberated nine square kilometres in the area. So uh, the the claim is, well, let's, let's look a bit more before I go to the larger idea about reinforcement. So south of Bakhmut, Stormtrooper Osman also conv uh, confirmed further progress. It is rumoured that Ukrainian forces have almost cleared all the forest strips and fields east of the Donbass Canal towards Klyschivka, and the city is within sight. Uh, so there you go with that claim. And in the Bakhmut direction, to be honest, things are going very hard on the flanks of Bakhmut, Klyschivka and Bakhivka because the Russians started throwing large reserves to hold Bakhmut. Bakhmut, and I'd say that's more so probably in the north. There were already news about this before. Bakhmut is a sacred place of propaganda for Russia. So the idea, and but this is one of the objectives of Bakhmut. So on the one hand, ah, uh, yeah, that's that's really annoying because that's slowing down our progress. But on the other hand, I think the primary objective is to attract all the reserves there, to fix them all in place in Bakhmut because they know it's a big PR place and they can't lose it just after they've supposedly gained it. Uh, and so if they are throwing huge numbers of troops in and equipment to stop the Ukrainian, Ukrainians advancing, then, yeah, that will be difficult for the Ukrainians. But, hey, job done. Uh, so, so it depends how, what your objectives are as to how you measure success. Um, heavy battles are ongoing in all directions of the Ukrainian front. Ukraine's army is gradually advancing in the Berdyansk and Melitopol directions, while in the east, Russians are advancing in several directions, a Ukrainian uh, officials say, but it's all rather vague. Zaporizhia Axis, Russian sources now report heavy battles near Robot Robotina. Robotina. Uh, that's how I heard it pronounced on uh, reporting from Ukraine, so that's what I'm going with. Finally, some idea of how to correctly pronounce that, maybe. Yesterday, uh, satellite images revealed and confirmed that fighting was on the very outskirts. Well, Gonzo reports that Ukrainian troops have advanced somewhat towards Luhivska. I said that that was actually taken because Andrew Perpetua had satellite imagery to suggest that Ukrainians were being shelled in Luhivska. Uh, so... But it depends who you listen to, I guess. Uh, and uh, from Pryutne, Zaporizhia is about... In Zaporizhia, so this is near in the Velika Novosilka area where they're advancing on Priyutna. Uh, this is just gives you an indication of how far from the from the Surovikin line for the first area of large trenches that the Russians have have built. You know how far it is from Priyutna. We know that Robotina it is you know is right next to the lines of defense there. They possibly have even traversed uh, those big trench lines but in the Velikonova Silka area it is further the the fighting has been much more in the sort of open although there will be smaller trenches in every sort of tree line it's not like they don't have trenches it's just they don't have these big continual trenches uh, that the, the, the as some people call it the Surovikin line um, right, Russian mill blogger Rebars claimed that the Russian Ukrainian forces, sorry, have made gains on the outskirts of Robotina. Quote, fighters of the 1430th Regiment of the Russian Armed Forces retreated to reserve positions on the left flank. Ukrainian forces were able to penetrate approximately 300 meters. Uh, and Romanov uh, says about the bridgehead uh, in... This is in Kherson now, so we're going across to the Antonivsky Bridge. The, quote, the real situation, so this is a pro-Russian, the real situation on the left bank near the bridge, to put it mildly, is radically different from that described in the report. So he refers to the Russian MED claiming that Ukrainian forces have been ousted from the Antonivsky Bridge area. Uh, credible sources also state its opposite. So he's saying 
basically the Russian MOD are lying. So when ple- people like Clive Engel on my threads put the TASS reports on what the a Russian MOD is saying every day, puts exactly what the Russian MOD is saying. And I pay absolutely no attention. It's kind of pointless because the Russian MOD talk out their ass. And this is the claim from the Russians themselves. Like, yeah, that's not happening. It's way worse. The Ukrainians haven't been ousted and you know, it's it's still difficult around the Antonivsky Bridge area. So anyway, just to give you a bit of uh, perspective there. Right, going on to geopolitical stuff. Shell are still trading Russian gas despite uh, the pledge to stop. It is a little bit more nuanced than just like having a go at Shell, although probably there's probably a lot of good reason to be able to have a go at Shell here. So I, I don't know how strong contracts are and what happens with contracts in the context of sanctions and war. So Shell still trading, says the BBC, uh, Russian gas despite the pledge to stop. Shell is still trading Russian gas more than a year after pledging to withdraw from the Russian energy market. The company was involved in nearly an eighth of Russian shipborne gas exports in 2022, according to analysis from campaign group Global Witness. Oleg Ustenko, an advisor to Ukrainian President Zelensky, accused Shell of accepting blood money. Shell said that the trades were the result of long-term contractual commitments and do not violate laws or sanctions. And I assume that's probably correct. Like if they were violating sanctions, they wouldn't be doing it, right? They they'd be in a lot of trouble. So they must they must still be able to do this. It's whether they should be doing this, and then it comes down to if they weren't doing this, then they're opening themselves up to be sued. And then there's also issues with energy supply globally, and the fact that you know certain nations literally would would have then have no energy type thing. So I'm not trying to defend Shell here. I'm trying to understand what's going on. However, you know, there is a strong case that, you know, they are accepting blood money, of course. As recently as 9th of May, a vast tanker capable of carrying more than 160,000 cubic meters of gas compressed into liquid form, liquefied natural gas or LNG, pulled out of the Port of Sabeta on the Yamal Peninsula in Russia's far north. The cargo, that cargo was purchased by Shell before heading to onwards to its ultimate destination, Hong Kong. It is one of the eight LNG cargoes that Shell has bought from Yamal this year, according to data from uh, Plur, again, not enough consonants, not enough vowels, sorry, a database analyzed by Global Witness. Last year, Shell accounted for 12% of Russia's seaborne LNG trade, Global Witness calculates, and was among the top five traders of Russian originated LNG that year. In March 2022, in the weeks following the invasion of Ukraine, Shell apologized for buying cargo of Russian oil. Uh, and said it intended to withdraw from Russian oil and gas. It said it would stop buying Russian oil, sell its service stations and other businesses in Russia, which it has done. It has also ended its joint ventures with the state energy giant Gazprom. And it said it would start a phased withdrawal from Russian petroleum products, pipeline gas and LNG. But it warned that it would be a complex challenge. So it seems to have been good on what it's kind of done, and it's phasing out LNG supply. However, it goes on to say here, well, since then it has kept taking cargoes of LNG from two Russian ports, the one at Yamal and the one at Sakhalin in the far east. Shell used to be the minority investor in Sakhalin gas project, but abandoned that claim in September last year after the Russian government transferred its shares to a local business and since then has taken no gas from Sakhalin. But it still honours the contract that the Russian LNG company Novatech, which obliges it to buy 900,000 tonnes a year from Yamal until the 2030s, according to the Reuters news agency. So on the one hand, it's it's fulfilling its contractual obligations, and that takes it up to 2030 and is probably taking a pretty penny for doing so. But on the other hand, which is must evidently be w- within the rules of the sanctions. But on the other hand, that is putting money in the pockets of the Kremlin. H- can that be shut down, that contract? Can it be stopped? Should it be stopped? All these questions. So I don't I don't really know the answer there. I mean, Oleg Ustenko has said it's quite simple. By continuing to trade in Russian gas, Shell is putting money into Putin's pockets and helping to fund Russia's brutal aggression against the people of Ukraine. The vast sums that Shell and the whole oil industry have made in Russia should be used to help fund the reconstruction of Ukraine rather than lining the pockets of their shareholders. 
uh, on the one hand, very, very true. And then the, the people will come back to that saying, yeah, but that they the shareholders pay pension pots and so on and so forth. So it's just massively confusing, complex. Um, there is a dilemma between putting pressure on the Russian government over its atrocities in Ukraine and ensuring stable, secure energy supplies. It is for governments to decide on the incredibly difficult trade-offs that must be made. That's a spokesperson for Shell. Shell has stopped buying Russian LNG, Russian LNG on the spot market, uh, but still has some long-term contractual commitments. This is in full compliance with sanctions, applicable laws and regulations of the countries in which we operate. So that's you know both sides of the stories story there um yeah one for you guys to discuss in the thread below no doubt biden will visit the uk nato summit in lithuania and then finland uh, says the white house the europeans or the american president will lo- i wonder who his supply act, uh, his uh, support act is uh the european tour of the american president will last from july the 9th to the 13th biden also plans to discuss ukraine with swedish pm ulf christensen who will visit the united states on july the 5th and meet with the u.s president they will discuss support for ukraine sweden's accession to NATO, China, the fight against climate change and new technologies. Biden is certainly going to be busy over the next few weeks uh, in the lead up to the NATO summit. Uh, Phillips O'Brien says very heartening that President Biden is going to Vilnius. So this is, I guess, really important. Uh, It didn't need to go to the NATO summit, but the US president being the most important politician in the world, arguably, is uh, going to be at the NATO summit. And that gives that it the the gravitas that I think it deserves. At, at the least, that means something tangible must have been agreed, re Ukraine and uh, NATO. It does not mean immediate membership, probably. Can't imagine the president risking an embarrassment at Vilnius over Ukraine. Uh, so he interprets that as being positive. I talk about US domestic... Okay. Um, support for Ukraine is so high, particularly among Democrats, that the president actually has to be careful. He can't look to be going soft on support for Ukraine. Uh, says Phillips O'Brien. So, yeah, interesting uh, moves there. That's going to be, uh, I mean, the world's press is going to be looking very closely at that NATO summit in a way it probably never has done at any other NATO summit. That Vilnius, and I think that's a really good point. If Biden's going there, you would assume that there is something positive that has been already sorted out. He's not going to be going there and then it's going to be, yeah, we're not going to do anything for uh, for Ukraine and we're going to make it even more difficult. That will be, that's the wrong kind of, PR to get out of that. So I assume there'll be some really big positive news coming out of that if he's going to be there. That I so I'd agree with Phillips O'Brien on how to interpret that. Anyway, that's the news for today. Please like, subscribe, and share. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate all your support. Um, take care and I'll speak to you soon.